Uh, yeah, thanks Elliot and uh, Alexis and Paul for putting us together and for inviting us. Um, this is a, a really fun time. Um, I really enjoyed uh, this session last year and, and knew I wanted to be part of it again this year. So uh, Maze is a startup biotech uh, that started about, nine, we launched about nine months ago with the mission of bringing together human genetics and functional genomics into a platform um, to develop new medicines that change the course of disease. And there was a reason that we thought uh, that the founders and the investors um, and the staff thought that the time was right for this. And that is that if you look at the emergence of genetics data globally, there's been a vast explosion of, of biobanks and uh, data sources where um, in excess of uh, two million and more people have been um, fully genotyped um, and also have deep, deep phenotype information on them. Um, and this, this is actually not even counting the, uh, um, the proprietary lockdown data sets like 23andMe and Ancestry. But um, there's just a huge resource globally uh, and uh, there's a lot of opportunity to take advantage of that. In addition, there's been the, uh, an, uh, just an astounding emergence of new tooling around functional genomics. And most of this is related to uh, new developments in CRISPR technology as well as single cell sequencing. And our goal at Maze is to take these two orthogonal data sets that are really measuring variation, human variation in different ways, and to integrate them and use them to um, uh, derive some insight into disease biology, to find and develop targets, and to meet, um, uh, address unmet medical needs. Um, and, and I think, you know, one way to think about this is that human genetics and functional genomics really are orthogonal sources. Human genetics is, is the, the picture of natural variation that we see after millennia of, of evolution. Um, and functional genomics is synthetic variation. So this is the experimental um, uh, counterpoint to the, to the human genetics. And um, uh, one of the, our founders, Mark Daly, uh, likes to make the point that um, there's the, the data is out here now and it's, it's really, success is not gonna come from uh, to the person who owns the most data. It's really gonna be the best consumer of genetics data. And that's, that's our goal is to be the best consumer of genetics data and also the best at integrating genetics data with experimental functional genomics data. So many of you may, may be familiar with this, uh, this type of a figure. This is a, a, a very simplified overview of what happens in something called a gene, genome-wide association study. Um, and this is really uh, made possible, again, by these large amounts of data that allow statistical significance to, to rise to a level where you start to believe the results. Um, in a genome-wide association study, you will start with a group of people with some disease and people without the disease, and now there's a lot of variation uh, between and among those groups. But if you get a big enough uh, set of people in the cases and the controls and you compare them gene variant by variant, site by site across all three billion sites in the genome, you can start to get little tags of uh, segments of the chromosome that um, associate with the disease state. Um, and this so-called Manhattan plot here um, is uh, one common way of representing this. And in this case, you can see that there are a number of, of peaks that are rising above the, uh, the red line there for statistical significance. And those are areas of the chromosome that associate with uh, the disease um, that, that's being examined. Um, now that's really just the beginning though. That just gets you kind of in the, in the ballpark of, of roughly where um, a gene that might be causative of the disease is. And what we like to do is take a more nuanced view. And to do this, we use um, a, uh, a tool called an allelic series. Now this is assuming we have focused in on a gene that we think might be causative for a particular disease, and, and we will have found that out through a, um, a GWAS study. Um, the idea then is to survey across all the variation in humans and look for variation that has different effects on the protein that the gene codes for. Uh, and then what you would like to do is associate those effects, that, that protein level effects, with the actual phenotype. So you can see that um, on the x-axis here, I've, I've got the functional effect of the variant. To the far right uh, would be a complete knockout. So that means that the gene is not functional, the protein is not functional in that particular person. Um, and in this particular example, that causes disease. That's the highest risk of, of disease um, in, in that situation. Um, but there's a whole range of, um, of a, a gradation down to where that gene might be actually increased expression and it might convey a protective effect. The nice thing about a, an allelic series is it, it, it gives you this dose response curve. So it gives you a lot of confidence that the gene that you're looking at really is a good target for the disease. It's causative for the disease, it's influencing the disease directly and not just as a, as a side effect of something else. So there are a couple of different patterns you can see when you um, get a allelic series. Um, this is one that you like to see because it shows that when a gene, um, there are variants in a gene that cause it to lose the protein's function, um, the severity of the disease goes down. That means people carrying a, um, 
a variant that knocks out this particular gene are less likely to have the disease, or if they have the disease, it's less severe. And a really good example of this is PCSK9, um, which is involved in um, um, low-density lipoprotein levels um, and also uh, decreased incidence of cardiovascular events. And it turns out if you target this gene, and essentially you can knock it out completely, the, the rate of cardiovascular events goes down. And so this has become the basis for um, a, a blockbuster drug. Um, there's one challenge here, though, which is that you can't just go around and knock out a gene because it affects a particular disease. There may be other consequences. So, uh, for example, um, TDP43 is, uh, is a gene that's inv um, uh, involved in ALS, which is a, um, a, a brutal, horrible disease. You would like to be able to knock it down. It's got this same allelic series um, effect, but if you knock it down, you're removing it from participation in other cellular processes that it needs to be there for. So you can't just, you can't just knock down TDP43. So you have to do something else, and I'll get to that something else in just a second. Um, the other kind of uh, allelic series you might see is something like this, where as a gene is knocked out, the, uh, the risk of the disease or the severity of the disease goes up. Um, and uh, there are a whole number of examples of this, and you, you can imagine that there's a biochemical process, and if you knock out one of the steps in the biochemical process, there's an accumula toxic accumulation of something, uh, and that causes disease. And the problem here is that you can't easily um, drug that gene now. You can't drug it in the sense of knocking it out. If you could somehow replace the function, that would work, and there's, there's work um, moving in those directions but it's just, it's, it's more intrinsically difficult to drug this kind of a gene. So again, we need to look for an alternative um, target in this case. And um, let's see, oh, just to, to show that um, there's no reason that these curves have to be linear. Um, it's, the, you know, there are lots of different patterns that you might see here. Um, and each pattern tells you a little bit more about the, the way the gene works in the context of the disease. So building these uh, allelic series takes data from many different sources. One of, the, one of the, the primary sources is this genetics data that we find that, that we can get access to um, globally. Um, UK Biobank is probably the prime example of this. This is um, 500,000 genotyped um, people in, uh, from England and a, a large number of um, sequenced people as part of that cohort. Um, MVP is the Million Veteran Program um, that um, in, in this country, uh, and there are others. Um, they all do things a little bit differently. Um, they've got different base cohorts, different base populations. Uh, the allele frequencies are different, and so they're not exactly equivalent, but it is a good source of, of um, a variation that we can use to build an understanding of these relationships. And then for the functional genomics, uh, or the functional variant annotation, um, we usually start with a, um, a, a variant effect prediction, just using an algorithm. Does, is there a stop codon in the middle of the gene that probably knocks out its function? Uh, that only gets you so far, though. You really need to do uh, a, a deeper dive to, to understand if a variant is, is likely to um, kill the protein's function or just reduce its function. Um, and to do that, you, you, uh, we rely on data from many, many other sources, including, um, and I think this showed up on Elliot's slide, um, GTEx, which is um, uh, a database of gene expression in different tissues. And if you can figure out that a variant is likely to increase or decrease the expression of your target gene, that can go, that's data that can go into the f uh, creation of the allelic series. Um, but there are also experimental techniques that you can use, and um, this is one that we're um, uh, investing a lot of effort in. Um, it's called deep mutational scanning, and essentially it, uh, the, the idea is that you go in and systematically permute every single amino acid in the protein to every other single amino acid, and then you, um, if you d design it in such a way that you have a good assay and a good readout, you can start to um, understand um, what the consequences of, of any particular variant are on that protein. So um, I talked about earlier about how these, these difficult cases where we can't directly drug a gene or there's, there's reasons why we don't want to drug a, a particular target um, and we need an alternate. And this is something that, um, that is uh, known as a modifier uh, uh, to the, to the uh, original um, disease-causing gene. And in fact, um, uh, Maze was started with this being the primary idea. It was going to be a company that finds modifiers, and we still are, are focused largely on that, although we've broadened out a little bit. Um, actually, our original name was going to be Modulus, and literally a week before we filed for that name, a company in Japan, we found out, just came out as Modulus Therapeutics, um, and we were, okay, that's okay, Japan, but then they opened a, um, an office in Cambridge like the next week, and so we decided we weren't, weren't going to be able to use Modulus, so Maze is good, though. We enjoy Maze. Um, but modifier screens can be done a couple of different ways. Um, one is genetically, and again, this is only possible because of the vast amounts of data that are out there. Um, and in this case, unlike with a, a standard GWAS where you're looking at a case versus a control, here we're taking 
people, all of whom have a disease gene, so they're all expected to get the disease or they all are, have an increased risk for that, for the particular disease. But we're looking at the extremes of actual outcome. So people who actually end up never getting the disease versus those who get it early, that kind of thing. And if you can compare those cohorts and they're big enough and you've done enough of the right controls, you can get a similar kind of um, highlighting of the loci that actually also affect that disease. They kind of act as a modifier to the first case. And then those can become likely targets. So um, an example here of how you do this experimentally is with, um, with CRISPR screening. And I'm sure a lot of people here um, are, are, um, understand and, and, and follow the literature on CRISPR screens. But essentially, this is a way that you can knock out in a lab, in a, in a lab setting, um, end up with a pool of cells, each one of which has one specific gene knocked down. And you can track what that gene is, and you can look at the behavior of that particular cell. In this case, um, and this is from a real program that, that's underway, um, we've got uh, a protein that increases risk for a severely debilitating disease. Um, we've done a CRISPR screen where we've knocked down um, globally, genome-wide, all of the genes, uh, and then taken that pool of cells, each one of which has one gene knocked down, and looked for um, the, uh, the amount of this toxic protein that's in that cell. And we use this, uh, used fact sorting in this case. Um, and after sorting the, the, um, the cells and then uh, figuring out what gene went with the high, um, the high concentration versus the low concentration, we can plot um, this sort of standard um, volcano plot here. And um, what you should notice with this is that um, there are five red spots over on the top left. And these actually represent um, the guides that were um, directly against the target gene of our interest. Um, and so what this says is that if you knock down the gene that causes the disease um, so that it has, uh, it's, it's less prevalent in the cell, um, then it's less prevalent in the cell. But uh, interestingly, you can see that the next, you know, the, there's another set of genes following that also you can knock down and get, uh, if you knock down that gene, you also get a decrease in this particular protein. So these are, this, this now opens up, you know, in this case, you know, nine or ten different possible other targets that, that might be more amenable to drugging than the, than the first one. Um, and you can take this in, in a, a number of different directions. It's not just for target discovery and validation, but um, if you take a drug against um, this particular protein um, and, uh, and do a similar kind of um, treatment um, where you're looking at the, uh, the genome-wide knockdowns, if there's a pathway that's knocked down that the drug acts through, then you're going to see a distinction in those particular genes in that pathway, and that's what I'm showing here. So this, this, these kinds of techniques are, are very, very powerful, not only to identify and validate targets, but also to understand the, the mechanisms of action of the drugs that you're putting against those targets. So um, the, the goal of our computational platform really is, um, is, is pretty uh, ambitious, and that's to uh, integrate, identify and integrate data from all these different sources, including um, GWAS and modifier screens that have been done outside of our company, uh, the raw data that those GWAS screens have used. Um, we are generating our own functional genomics screen data uh, at, at a large volume. And then we also need to integrate uh, the genomics and genetics resources such as GTEx and Nomad and, and, um, and other databases. And um, the, you know, unlike some of the other speakers, uh, our challenge is not so much with, with the, the volume or the velocity of the data, it's really about the variety. This is, this is lots of different pools of siloed data sources. And that's, that's what our main difficulty is, is integrating them into the, into the uh, coherent picture for the target and, and the drug program. So um, it makes scaling kind of hard, and, um, and we're, we're largely stuck with a manual process right now. Um, with a lot of these new um, functional genomics techniques, uh, the lab methods are not really ready for prime time or production, and we're, so we're investing a lot in, in uh, making those production ready. Um, and similarly, the computational methods are not always nailed down, so we've had to kind of go back and reinvent some of the computational methods. Um, and then it's always a challenge to find the right genetics data sources and, um, and to understand um, you know, what cohort actually will work to answer a particular question. So um, as of uh, today, uh, we've been pretty successful with this, though, in this, in this um, uh, endeavor. Um, we've got candidate selection in progress for a handful of, of modifiers, handful of targets, uh, spanning a wide range of therapeutic areas. Um, we have built a robust genetics pipeline. Um, there, there are manual components to it, but it is a robust genetics pipeline uh, for new target discovery and validation. And we're generating um, on the order of three to four um, uh, highly valuable targets per year. 
And then we're routinely deploying these functional genomics assays in, uh, in multiple biologically relevant cell lines. Um, our computational platform currently is enabling the standard um, uh, bioinformatics processes and pipelines that, that everyone uses, um, and also integration of, of some of these association statistics um, across different phenotypes, um, as well as integration of meta-analysis uh, uh, studies that have been done. We're still working on getting the integration of these other data sources, though, and that's, that's really been the challenge. And I just want to end on that um, because I think that there's some, some real um, opportunities here. Um, and uh, listening to the previous speakers, it's, it felt like they were um, telegraphing my challenges because they had the same ones. Um, and there really is, I think, a, a, an amazing opportunity for us as small biotechs to cooperate um, pre-competitively on computational and data infrastructure and to just like agree on the same format for storing things and agree on the same place where it's going to be and agree that if we're, um, if we're maintaining a data source that we do it um, according to the best practices of, of, uh, of data science. Um, the TRV AWS Biotech Blueprint has been um, just a phenomenal uh, piece of our success to date. I feel like um, I started and I could get going right away. Um, hit, we, we hit the ground running because of that. Um, and um, we're still learning a lot and still hoping to develop more of that. Um, and then finally, the AWS Open Data Initiative really is, um, I think, a great opportunity to, to um, bring some structure to all of our efforts to integrate these different siloed data sources uh, and make them more reliable. And I just want to end with um, some acknowledgments of the people who, um, who did this work, our human genetics department, functional genomics department, um, and my group. And happy to take questions. Thanks.